Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you're joining us online, on YouTube, at one of our Rockfish Church gatherings, or you're here in the building, the good old brick and mortar building. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We are on part two of a sermon series entitled Armed and Dangerous. We really believe that, that we need to be prepared to give answers for the questions that people might have. We really believe that, it is, that we need to be settled in our faith in what we believe and why we believe it. Uh, we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not ashamed of the claims made in the word. And we're not afraid to look and, and compare those claims to the real world that we live in. And that's what we're going to be doing in the first part of this particular series that we have entitled Answering the Atheist. Last week, and, and when I say that again, I'm talking about an answering those, those parts and settling those issues on the inside of each one of us that would cause us to question things at certain times, often very pivotal times in our, in our journey or our walk with Jesus. Last week, we talked about the idea of the compatibility between science and God, the idea that they're, they're not opposed to one another, that science shows uh, functionality, it, it doesn't show purpose. I think we were able to make that very clear. If you missed that, I would invite you, please go back, check that out. This week, we're going to take a, a look into something that is particularly fascinating to me. As I've stated on several occasions, I always wanted to be an archaeologist when I was a little kid. Just something really appealed to me because of the bigness of the whole thing. I love dinosaurs, and I think I could name just about every one. I've forgotten most of them now. But we're going to be looking at the geological evidence of the flood. You know, the National Academy of Science concludes this, and I want to quote this to you. It says, science does not have the processes to prove or disprove the evidence of God. Guys, a lot of the things that we experience, a lot of things that we know, a lot of the conclusions that we come to, they're not brick and mortar conclusions. There's a lot of things that's true that, that we don't know. Have you ever been in one of those places where you discovered something that was true that you had no idea, but your knowing it made no difference whatsoever? And I think that's kind of what it is. We don't understand all of the aspects of God. We never will understand all of the aspects of God, or he probably wouldn't be God, but that doesn't diminish his reality. Let's, um, let's take a look at some things. Let's look at the, big, the biblical context of the flood, and we're going to be looking in Genesis and looking at the book of Genesis, but Genesis 7, 11 through 12. I'm going to put it up on the screen and we can read it together. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, that's pretty, spe that's pretty specific, that's not exactly arbitrary, on the day, on that day, all of the springs of the great deep burst forth. And the floodgates of heaven were open, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Just something to consider when we're talking about this particular uh, event. We're not just talking about rain that's coming down. We're talking about the depths of the great being opened, or the fountains of the deep being opened. And you can Google this or research this on your own. Guess what was just discovered beneath the mantle of the earth? An ocean that is approximately three times the size of the ocean that's on the earth. You know, for many years, people said, there's not enough water on the earth to cover the entirety of the earth. Well, it turns out there's more than enough water to cover, just as the Bible said. Now, science catches up with that. We hear that later. But how many people and, uh, you know, just took that and looked at that and rationalized and came to an erroneous conclusion just because of ignorance? You know, there's a, it, it was true whether we knew it or not. See, guys, there are certain aspects of our lives that show us over and over that we can trust God. He's made his trustability, if you will, very evident in so many things. You can trust that the sun will come up today. You can trust that it's not so random that we lie awake at night in fear of whether or not the sun will come up tomorrow. We know God has set certain things in order. It's just a little tidbit of information. So the Genesis account, so the Genesis account, if it is accurate, there should be evidence of such a cataclysmic event. Would you agree? There should absolutely be observable evidence. The question that I want to answer today and the question that I want us to consider and really reason through is this. Is there reasonable evidence 
for us to believe the biblical account of the flood. You know, because I think a lot of people would go, oh, it's a flood myth, it's a flood myth. Well, let me just throw this out there. Every culture out there has a flood myth. Maybe you should consider if they didn't collaborate that all of them have come to a conclusion because something was passed on. There may have been an event. That's neither here nor there. Anyway, is there reasonable evidence for the, for the biblical account of the flood? A flood that was, number one, worldwide. Number two, singular and unique in world history. And the third part, I believe we're going to see of, is of significant importance, was it sudden and cataclysmic? In other words, was it an event that happened singularly? Was it worldwide? And did it happen suddenly? So let's begin with some definitions. And here's the fun part. You know, last week we were accused of using some big words. And sometimes big ideas require big words. So I want to explain these words or explain some of these definitions because they are important. Now, how we see things or the lens through which we make our interpretations of the things that we experience in this world is called a what? It's called a worldview. I refer to it as the lens or, or our worldview lenses. So there's two definitions here. One is catastrophism, okay? The other one is uniformitarianism. Let me give you some definitions. Catastrophism is the evidence-supported theory that changes in the Earth's crust during geological history have resulted, chief, have resulted chiefly from sudden, violent, and unusual events. This was the predominant view held until the late 18th, early 19th century. So it's the idea that there was something that happened in the world's crust, what we see geologically, doesn't look like it did at one point. There was an event that was huge and massive that formed a lot of what we see today. Uniformitarianism, also known as the doctrine of uniformity or the uniformitarian principle, is the assumption that the same natural laws, and this is important, and processes that operate in in our present day scientific observations have always operated in the universe in the past and apply everywhere in the universe and on the earth. So uh, uniformitarianism is the idea that when you go outside and you look, how things are is how they've always been. And anything that is going to take place is going to be slow and gradual over these massive amounts of time. And I'm going to get to why that's important in just a minute. Uniformitarianism emerged in the late 18th century prim primarily through the work of a man called James Hutton. And it was further advanced or developed and popularized in the early 19th century by a man named Charles Lyell. This is important. These guys were trying to build on some of the Darwinian ideology that was being developed around that time. The unfortunate reality uh, about history is that it's in the past, uh, which means that we can, neither, we, can either, we can do one of two things. We can either extrapolate the past based on the current data that we have, or we can rely on documented accounts, or both. See, history, you know, people say this, whoever wins the war gets to write the history, right? So sometimes those, those eyewitness accounts, they can be somewhat subjective. There may be a difference between people's interpretation of how history went and how it really was. In this case, we're basing what we know or we know concerning the flood on, on what people observed, either directly experientially or what their relatives or somebody had passed down at one time or the other. So what do these two worldviews have to do with deciding on how reasonable it is to determine if the biblical account of the flood is true? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at the rise of evolution. The theory of evolution relies heavily, if not completely, on the idea of uniformitarianism. In other words, they needed something. Um, the theory of evolution suggests this, that organisms change over time through genetic variation and what we refer to as natural selection. Most of us have heard that. Evolution relies on long time scales for small changes to accumulate leading to diverse life forms. Now, I know that's in the biological area. We're going to be looking at that next week. But in the geographical area, you needed time. You needed some geological evidence to, to create, create the idea for all of these changes on a, on a, a biological level to occur. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. 
Anyway, evolution relies on a time scale for small changes to accumulate. Uniformitarianism provides the concept of deep time necessary for evolutionary changes to happen. While uniformitarianism is a geological principle, it sets the stage for biological evolution by assuming an old earth. And, uh, you know, we've all heard it. The earth is uh, 3.4 billion years old. We've been taught that. That's what the schools have taught us. That was, that was embraced, again, late 18th century, early 19th century. The changes or the time scale has varied, but we've been taught that. Your kids have been taught that. We've all been told that. Now, the magic answer. Now, whether the doctrine of uniformity or the theory of evolution, time is the magic answer. There had to be something that would allow this massive amount of time that would cause all of these massive changes that we see today in the earth that would explain it. So biological evolution is the, is the process through which species of organisms change over time through variations in their genetic material. The process leads to the diversity of life that we see on the earth driven by mechanisms such as natural selection, mutation, gene flow, and genetic drift. Here's the problem. The, the number or the, the mathematic probability of mutations, you have to understand something about mutations. One, when we talk about gene mutations, a positive gene mutation is less than 1% of all mutations. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more next month I don't want to, or next week. I don't want to bore you, bore you with this. But that means that 99, at least 99% of all genetic level mutations are either neutral or harmful. Less than 1% is positive. Okay, so, so the idea of evolution is that all of these positive changes accumulated, but we know that the mathematical percentage and probability of that happening is so low, so it's got to be spread out over millions of millions of years. And all of a sudden, you need some other force working on it, natural selection. Natural selection is an idea. It's not a force. But, but natural selection we hear is working on things and, and adaptation is working and, and we hear all of these things. But again, the vast majority of mutations at the genetic level are, neither, are either neutral or harmful. Now, mutations on a DNA level have, and this is what's amazing, this, is, this has just been discovered. Your DNA has built-in redundancy. In other words, if a mutation was to occur in your, in your DNA, your DNA has a built-in ability to take that mutation, do away with it, and recreate it just to avoid mutation. So, so think about that. How counterintuitive would that be to the concept of evolution that we've been taught? Now, this is something that's just recently discovered. You can find all of this. All of this information is out there, but it's not information that is, that is put forth because it just doesn't fit the current concept, the current structure, the current ideologies that do away with the idea of God and replace him with the magic, with the magic long-time solution. Anyway, uh, so this means that the only way, uh, hang on, my stuff's not i got to see this. And guys, I, I'm, I'm going to be very transparent when it comes to a lot of what I'm telling you. I, and I said this at Rayford last week. I didn't sit around and come up with this stuff. I didn't pontificate over this stuff. I began to do research and study what smart people are saying. A lot of this information comes from somewhere called Answers in Genesis. I don't know if you're aware of it. I would, I would please jot that down. Go and check, check out a lot of the information that they have. They keep it really up to date. And these are some of the most brilliant scientific minds in the world are working for this particular, for this particular entity. And it's not just them. There's a lot of them out there. Anyway, this means that the only ways to get past the presently observable fact is to create a massive time span that is exactly what the doctrine of uniformity does. It provides a magic answer that's not observable and it's not provable, but it's enough. It was enough to convince people to depart and to accept it. So this, this time gap. Now, the theory of the gaps versus... Uh, the God of the gaps. And I'm going to get into the evidence in just a minute. I'm just trying to lay this groundwork so we kind of understand why this works. In order to do away with God, we had to have this massive scale to come up with, with 
you know, this, this idea of, of micro and macro evolution. So the gap theory in Genesis, this theory is about the creation story of the Bible, specifically in Genesis chapter 1 between verses 1 and verses 2. It suggests that there is a gap of time between the first two verses. Now you can hear this, and again, guys, I just, this is the information. I'm just giving you information. Uh, the idea is that Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. It happened, and a long, long time ago, and then something happened to make earth formless and void. So it says, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, paused, then there was a space of millions and millions of years, and then something happened that disrupted the whole cycle, and when we come back in the next verse, it says it was formless and without wo vo um, void, and water covered the face of the deep. Now, some people think that this gap could have lasted millions of years and maybe included prehistoric events, dinosaurs, and other creatures that we find fossils of today. The gap theory is one way that people try to reconcile the biblical account of creation with the scientific theories of earth being very, very old. And listen, again, there's a lot of smart people, you know, f you know have, have opinions on this, people smarter than myself, but this also has theological issues. If that is true, that that means during that big spatial gap, there was a lot of death that happened. And the Bible tells us that death did not enter until sin, sin did not enter until Adam's fall. So that becomes theologically, you know, problematic. So, but anyway, I'm, 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 I'm just giving you the theory. I'm not telling you what to believe on there. I'm pretty simple in this. I believe that the Word of God says what it says, and, it's, and we'll all see how he did it later. Now, let's look at some geological evidence that I believe allows us to, with a clear conscience and rational thinking, be able to absolutely accept the biblical account of the flood narrative in the Bible. Fossils above sea level. Fossils of sea creatures high above the sea level due to ocean waters having flooded over the continents. Uh, we find fossils on the top of almost every, excuse me, ocean fossils on the top of almost every mountain range on the face of the earth from the Himalayas uh, all the way over here to you know to simple old small North Carolina now there's two ways that you can look at this either the earth at one point was all flat and covered with water and these fossils somehow or these fossils were formed at that point or or these these mountains at a cataclysmic rate or because of a cataclysmic event, they, they were raised, something happened that caused these mountains to, to, to lift or the mountains were there and the sea level rose above them. So whether you think that the, all of the earth was flat and it was covered with water and these fossils, you know, you know, were formed during that period, that's fine. Or if you believe that the mountains were there and like the Bible says, the water went to 15 cubits above every single mountain on the face of the earth. Both of those are reasonable things to consider. Reasonable things that you can assume. Why? Because there's ocean fossils on the top of almost every mountain that's out there. You've got to do something with that information. The Bible offers what I, be, what I believe to be a very reasonable explanation. Uh, how about this one? Rapid burial. Now, now this, is, this is important. Rapid burial of plants and animals. We, we find excessive fossil graveyards and exquisitely preserved fossils. For example, uh, billions of what's called nautiloids. Fossils are found in layers within the red wall limestone of the Grand Canyon. We're going to look at some of these. I'm going to have some pictures for you in a few minutes. I always like illustrated sermons. Anyway, this layer was, dis was deposited catastrophically by a massive flow of sediment, mostly limestone. Well, how does that happen in the middle of Arizona? We'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Now, the chalk and coal beds of Europe, the United States, and the, all of these things, how they were formed, show that some type of organic material was massed together in some event and deposited in these massive depositories. It's where we get the oil fields. It's where we get oil and we see all of those things, and, 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 and that's interesting. So let me ask you a question just as, as we look at this, the rapid burial. Rapid, rapid burial is absolutely necessary to form fossils. In other words, when you look around, do you see fossils being formed today? Okay, you've got a squirrel. Anybody got squirrels? 
they eat your stuff. Or you see a, a possum beside the road that gets run over. Anybody ever seen a possum beside the road? Yeah. Does it turn into a fossil? Why doesn't it turn into a fossil? Because it's lacking the very element. That, again, if, if uniformitarianism is, is true, we should be amassing f- fossils at the same rate that we were amassing fossils back then. We don't see this functioning. And I'll, I'll come back to this in just a moment. But when that possum dies, what happens? Other little possums come and eat it, right? And birds come. And then it begins to deteriorate because of the elements. It doesn't lay there in its state for years and years until supposed sediment comes and builds up on top of it three miles deep. That's not the way fossils work. So we've all been told it takes how long to form a fossil? How long does it take? Millions and millions of years. Question is, is that true? Do you realize that when a, when a, uh, a, a animal or a plant is rapidly covered, the fossilization process begins almost immediately. Fossils can be formed in decades. Decades. Uh, we see this. There's been instances, it depends on the, the limestone or, or the, the minerals in the, in the earth and the conditions of the earth, the pressure of it all, but it, they all take rapid. Now, people would say, well, we do see this today. We do. We do see fossilization still occurring. We, we, we do on a very micro level. In, in fact, there's some, there's some sand dunes at the edge of the ocean that are deteriorating slowly, and sometimes those sand dunes fall on top of these unsuspecting little creatures. Or fish get washed up, and, this, and then all of a sudden they find themselves compressed under this massive amount of, of soil. And guess what begins to happen? Almost immediately they begin to fossilize. fossilize. But that's, that's not what we see happening on the top of every mountain range across the face of the earth right now, is it? We don't see it. You don't see it here. You don't see it on the side of the road. If uniformitarianism is true and the concept is, is consistent, then we should be we should be seeing what was forming fossils then, still forming fossils now. We don't necessarily see that. Number three, this, this is this, you're going to like this one. Geological evidence, uh, the strata succession. succession. Now, uh, m- many strata laid down over rapid succession. succession. T- take, take a look. I can show you better than I can tell you. Now, all of a sudden, you see all of these layers of strata or these layers of rock that are being laid down. Do you notice anything interesting about them? Now, these were supposedly laid down over the course of 480 million years. So if that first level down at the bottom is 480 million years, you mean that it's, <laughs> it stayed soft enough to bend along with the, level, the layer on top of it? I'm just saying, guys, th- think this through. So all of these layers, you notice some of them actually curve at a 90 degree. Let me show you this one. Here's here's another one. Look how the the rock actually bends. Not just one layer. I could get one layer out there and it bends. But that next layer, wouldn't it come and fill that gap? Would it bend too? Or are you telling me the million-year-old layer wasn't quite rock yet? And so they all happen. But it makes sense that all of these would be laid down in a very short time. And then they would all harden together, all having the same shape. That's just common sense. Again, like I say, people can argue with that, and people can come up with a lot of other conclusions. But they, they say, well, well, these rocks actually, the mountain began to grow, and all of these rocks bent in hindsight. That's one theory concerning this. Guys, anybody been a rock lately? There are small, tiny little cracks and fissures in here that, that's, that they say are indicative, of, or some say, are indicative of what would happen if this rock was, was bending. It's also the same thing that's indicative of mud drying to create the rocks in the first place. So, just some information to consider. How about this one? Check this one out. Again, rocks don't normally bend. They break. These are huge. They are massive swaths of limestone. <coughs> excuse me, and sandstone that are laid across every single co- continent, almost like somebody just took a bucket of water and just washed it across every continent. And they're thick layers that are there. Now, something I want to share with you that's particular, in, t- t- 
particularly interesting. When you look at these strata, when you look at all of these layers of rocks that were laid down over the course of the, I think this is the Grand Canyon that you're looking at, over the course of these millions and millions of years, two things I want you to notice. One, there is little to no erosion between these layers. If this layer here is a million years old and the one above it's a million years old, wouldn't do you think that in between those layers there would be significant erosion that took place during that time period? It's not there. Well, let's think a little differently. What about the millions and millions of years it took for that Colorado River to cut through those rocks? Don't you think that those rocks would be a lot smoother and a lot more erosion would have happened to this rock face instead of it being the jagged projections that it is right now? Well, if we go with uniformitarianism, we would know that that would have to be true. It would be impossible. The only way that this could actually happen is if something happened really fast. And, and people are seeing this. The, the Grand Canyon, I submit to you, as, a, as a, uh, the conclusion of very, very smart scientists and geologists, that it was created very, very quickly. Now, something happened, and there's reasons. Let me, let me give you a why. Anybody, ever re, anybody in here old enough to remember Mount St. Helens? In 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. Massive eruption. It blew out one side of, there was an earthquake underneath this volcanic, volcano type place. One side absolutely blew out. As it blew out, it, it had a, just a cataclysmic effect on things. Ash went everywhere. Layers of mud and lava and all of that stuff began to just pour out. Over the course of the next few weeks, something happened. People were actually able to observe the phenomenon that they believe actually formed the Grand Canyon. In one, one billionth of the time, mud flows begin to, water mixed with mud, begin to flow through the, through the, newly, formed, the newly formed ash and the newly formed layers that have been laid down over, uh, very, very quickly because of the volcanic action, ashes. That mud acted like sandpaper and cut right through those rocks. As it would cut through the rock, sides of the, of the canyon would collapse. So what they had was something that looked almost, ex it was 1 40th the size of the Grand Canyon, but looked just like the Grand Canyon. Somebody looking at it would go, well, this thing is billions and billions of years old. But we know how old it was. Rocks were taken from the cap of Mount St. Helens during the explosion. Rocks that were newly formed, and they were carbon dated. Guess how old they were? Well, we know how old they were. They were eight weeks old. <laughs> but the reality is that they carbon dated and tested out to be hundreds of thousands of years old. Guys, there's, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of data out there. But people say things and come to conclusions regarding that data based on their worldview and their pres presuppositions. We talked about that last week, what worldviews and presuppositions are. Let's, let's look at this, the geological evidence, and this is the, the last one, and I've already talked about it, so I'm going to move pretty quickly through this one. Current earth conditions, present earth conditions are not producing the fossils like we talked about. It's just not happening. We just don't see it. The idea of uniformitarianism as, as, as submitted to us is con inconsistent with what we see, not just in the fossilization process, but in a lot of different processes. We just don't see it. There was a newly formed section of the Grand Canyon that happened probably about seven years ago. A friend of mine, Alex McFarland, does a, he does a tour through the Grand Canyon. And there was uh, an event that occurred where part of the wall collapsed. When the part of the wall collapsed, it revealed the same layers with the same look that we see on the rest of the, on the, rest of the canyon. It took 45 minutes for this to take place. 45 minutes it took with the collapse of one of those walls to reveal and look just like the rest of the canyon. Upon observance, people would have looked and said, this thing is 480 years old. The river cut through this. That's, that's not what occurred at all. Why? Because they were there and they saw it. Remember when I said there's the unfortunate thing about history is we were not there. So some things we have to, we kind of have to just believe and look at the data and come to conclusions. Now, the point, why does this matter? And I know this is a lot. I know we're going over a lot of material. And if you think this is a lot, there's going to be a, a whole bunch more in the biological uh, area next week. We're going to look at um, 
some of the fascinating things that have happened in a recent, a recent study on D, DNA called the G, Genome Project. It has flipped what we thought we knew concerning DNA and how humans are made and constructed. It's really flipped it upside down. Um, some, of the, some of the world's most renowned Darwinists Neo-Darwinists are going, guys, we cannot continue down this road with this data. It is just absolutely inconsistent. You can look that up and you can read about it online as well. Again, I, the, the, the thing about today and the thing that makes it so hard for me as a preacher is that used to you guys would come and I would be the only source of information or your pastor would be the only source of information. Now there's tons of information out there. And there may be a better preacher on YouTube here or there as well. So you can listen to those guys and, and listen to what they say. I'm just, I'm just, no, what, thank you, but yeah. Anyway, um, but, but we're not relegated to just what we know. We have the knowledge of the world's most renowned scientists, every worldview right there for us to dissect. Re remember the question that I wanted you, wanted you to ask at the beginning. Based upon just the little bit of evidence that I've shown you, I believe it is perfectly reasonable for us to believe and accept the, the Genesis account. I don't believe, I, I think that if anybody come to you and, and said, well, you just believe in a fairy in the, in the sky, you're just basing it. Faith is trust in something, not trust in nothing. Faith is trust in God's word. It's something. It's not nothing or not, not something. Anyway, so what's the point? Why does this matter? Now, here's the truth. Whether the world is 4 billion years old or 4,000 years old, theories and evidence out there in some ways support both of those things. And people point towards valid things. I don't know if, if God created the earth old or he created it as, you know, with the appearance of being old. I don't know if Adam was born a baby necessarily. He wouldn't have had anybody to raise him. But, but all indications is that he was, he was created mature. Anyway, what do we find in the geological evidence, does it rule out God? Absolutely not. Does it confirm the account that we see in Genesis? In many ways, I believe we can absolutely say, yes, it does. Now, I had to, I had to shave off about a million other examples of geological evidence, okay? Uh, but I'm just going to tell you, there is a plethora of it out there. I'm, I'm almost out of time. I got about three or four minutes left. Um, so volume upon volume has been written, hypotheses have been concluded, presented as fact, uh, theological theories have been uh, presented as fact, stuff creeps in, there's tons of information and extrapolation. Our knowledge about something though, or our lack of knowledge about something doesn't change the truth. Did you hear that? We in no way have the ability to determine truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Can I tell you something? And there's some things that I want to go on and look at real quick in kind of a different perspective. Um, and it's this, why does this matter? It is the affirmation of a biblical truth. I want, I want to read something to you that, that maybe you haven't considered. Jesus, in whom we place our trust, in whom we place our hope, um, our eternal future, did he speak of a historical flood? Yeah, actually, he did. Can I read something to you that you might find interesting? Jesus said this in Luke 17, 26 and 27. He said, just as it was in the day of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and even being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So Jesus, God in flesh, the one in whom we put all of our trust, spoke of and believed in and acknowledged scripturally a historical event, a historical flood consistent with what Genesis said. So either it slipped up on Jesus and he didn't know, or we can trust him and we can trust it. He validated it through what he said. Don't know if you've considered that. Now, 2 Timothy 3.13 tells us this. It says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Righteousness being rightness before God and before man. Righteousness being rightness before God in the context of his creation and in relation to him and his creation. So the point, why does it matter? Affirming a biblical truth. How about this one? Understanding God's power and sovereignty. 
Guys, you understand that when you kick back, we can argue over the flood, but the big thing that we better consider is why he sent the flood in the first place. The Bible tells us that the heart of man was continually wicked. The degeneration of humanity had reached such epic proportions that man's hearts and minds and imaginations were filled with violence constantly. And here's the problem. God loves his people. And when, unjust, when injustice is reigning and murder and mayhem is occurring and people are crying out to God and, and wickedness reaches a place of crescendo, a just God must step in, and he did. And that's something that we really need to realize. Why can he do that? Number one, he is the measure and the standard of justice. Number two, he is sovereign, which means he is the measure and standard of justice. And because he is those things, he's also powerful enough to execute just judgment. And that's exactly what he said that he would do and did. He, he who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches mountains and they smoke. You understand that that's exactly what is described in the book of Genesis. It says that, the, that, the, that God himself came down in a dark cloud and he touched the top of Mount Sinai, the top of which right now is charred and you can walk on the charred rock of Mount Sinai today in history and time and space. You might not hear this talked about, but where God came down, he left the imprint of his fire on those mountaintops. Think about that. It's just wild. Because what happens is we create this false paradigm. It's referred to, and I'll talk about this in a philosophical capacity a little bit later, and we fall into this. We have this upper level story that is all things religious that really don't really matter in the real world. That's why you hear me saying that, that everything that we learn is for doing, not just for knowing. Because we have this idea that there's God and there's heaven and all that, and that's just some icing for my life. And then here's the real world where we live. This is the real world. So this upper story and this lower story, where the reality is that there is no upper and lower story. There is one worldview where God steps into time and space. God formed all that we try to exclude him from. There's one singular story, and Christ embodies that story for humanity. He embodies that worldview that is not only consistent with the realities that we learn in the spirit, it's also consistent with the evidence that we see within the context of his creation. He who looks at the earth and it trembles. You talk about a bad God. Well, bad being good. You talk about a tough God. You talk about a capable God. You know, the Bible says that in the last days there will come mockers and scoffers. Well, if God, you dumb dumb. And people are becoming very, very brazen. And, and that brazenness is pointed to, towards God, but it often manifests towards us. We're called idiots because we look soberly and reasonably at this world through the lens of what God has said and people have experienced and written in the word of God. People forget that the Bible is a historical document. People say it's not historical, it's stories. Okay, right. I was surprised that I'm going to spend some time in this series talking about the historical Jesus. Do you realize that, that the most ardent atheists, historians, agree that Jesus lived. They might disagree over who he was, but no intellectually honest person out there disagrees with the fact that Christ lived in time and space. He was crucified. He was buried. He was buried. He was crucified by, by Pilate. These are things that were documented extra biblically. In fact, he is so historically real that every religion out there, you name it, has come to a conclusion concerning him of necessity. He was that real. And that accepted as a part of history. Why would people do that with a mythical character or a figmentation of our imagination? All right. So the, the point, why does this matter? The affirmation of biblical truth, understand God's power and, 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 and sovereignty and integration of faith and reason. He told us, he said that we need to have a reason for what we believe. He said you need to be able to give an answer for the faith and the hope that is within you. And, and, and the, you know, the Bible says so is good enough. 
because you know you're consistent with truth and reality, but we have the ability to offer the very knowledge presented to us within the context of his creation that shows this. Now, let me show you that what I'm telling you is true, because some people will go, well, why are you talking about this, Pastor Tony? This is not biblical stuff. This is not theological. Actually, I, I submit to you that it is incredibly theological, and more churches should be talking about it. We should take the time to educate ourselves concerning it, which is what we're doing, for since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. In heaven's eyes, there is enough evidence within the context of creation through the reasonable the reasonable idea that something can't be produced from nothing to condemn all of humanity who rejects the idea of God. Can I cut to the chase and tell you what, and, and I'm not saying this to, to besmirch anybody or, or be nasty, but the Bible says in Proverbs, a fool has said within his heart that there is no God. A person who lacks reason is one of the definitions of a fool. Somebody who is wicked and unreasonable has declared there is no God. Common evidence, and according to the word of God, God and all of heaven says, I've provided you with enough within the simple context of creation to validate my existence, and I'll hold you accountable for that. That's scary. That's scary. So stand if you're able. We'll get out of here. Thank you for your time. I know I can get kind of geeky over this stuff, but man, I just, I get excited when I, see, when I see God's glory and his goodness and his power manifest here within the context of his creation, and you should as well. If you haven't done something with the historical Christ, if you haven't said, I will bow my knee to the lordship of the one true God, if you haven't acknowledged his power and his sovereignty, if you haven't taken a moment to, to, to set your soul to silence, and consider the state of your soul, I would encourage you, please do that. If you haven't pondered the idea, can, can something really come from nothing? I remember when I began to seek God because life wasn't working how I was doing it. Some of you are doing life and it's just not working for you. That's evidence that you're doing it wrong. I'm not saying that bad stuff doesn't happen. But when we fall into patterns of habitual harm to ourselves and to others, it is the natural evidence that we're walking in a way contrary to the loving God. See, God desires good for you. God desires to express his love to you and through you to those who are around you. But when life becomes obviously inconsistent with God's intentions, humility allows us to, to stop and kind of say, you know, maybe... Maybe I need to make some changes. That's what happened to me. I remember I looked at my life and I saw how inconsistent it was with reality and the multiplicity and multitude of things that just were not working and the harm that I was experiencing and creating in, in other people's lives. And I said, God, if you are real, I want to know you. If you are real, then what else really matters? God, if you are real, is there anything within the context of your creation that can compete with you? And the answer is no. Absolutely not. So I begin to seek God. If you haven't got to that point, or maybe you acknowledge him, but you've not bowed your knee and submitted your life to him, what's stopping you? What's stopping you? I would encourage you to, 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 to consider that today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the provision that you've made for us in the context of your creation through the person of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that he alone paid the penalty of sin that has caused so much death and destruction in this earth. Christ, you have become our exit door. You've become our escape clause from the justice demanded from the failures that occur in our lives in this world, you have, you've offered a pardon. Father, I'm asking you by the power of your Holy Spirit to draw us to a greater understanding, realization, and ultimately a, a full acceptance of you, your lordship, 
and your sacrifice. The sacrifice you made for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Father, guide us and lead us and draw us to you. In Jesus' name, amen.